everybody, I'm John Williams, and uh, you know, thank you very much for having me. It's a wonderful event. It's great that we get to have it here uh, at the uh, UT Stadium every year. Um, yeah, uh, and it is really, really nice to be talking to you, and thank you to all the organizers for having me. I uh, am the co-founder and chief product officer at Data.World. Uh, we are a venture-backed startup here in Austin. Uh, we've been around for about three and a half years. Uh, the quick elevator pitch is we are GitHub for data uh, if GitHub was backed by PrestoDB. Uh, it's been a heck of a ride. We're also the world's largest collaborative open data community at this point. Um, but really, my talk today is a lot about how my work with DevOps and working with folks in DevOps capacities has really truly enabled a ton of product agility uh, and business value uh, at the organizations I've worked at really for the last 20 years here in Austin. And uh, you know, my, my joke title is how I learned to stop worrying and love CI/CD. But first, let's talk um, a little bit about me for those of you that don't know me. Um, I am the Chief Product Officer of Data.World, um, but not only do I run product there, I also run the majority of the engineering team. Uh, we have a culture of accountability and responsibility there, and it's, ooh, we are not plugged in. No, Thank you. Oh. How's it going? There we are. Excellent. All right. Um, so um, I do run the majority of product and, uh, and, and the majority of engineering as well. However, the part of engineering that I don't run at data.world is uh, ops and hosting. Um, however, um, I am not a businessy product guy, I'm an engineering product guy. Uh, I'm a software engineer by trade and that's what I've done here in Austin for the last 20 years. And I've been lucky enough to work um, at a lot of really great companies here. Um, you know, as far as management philosophies go, I really fundamentally believe that to work at a product and engineering led company, you have to have product and engineering involved in the day to day operations of the business, right? If you want to be a leader as an engineer at the company, you have to learn and know businessy things. You have to know what the revenue is of your company. You have to know what the primary sales motion is of your company. Um, at the end of the day, you need to know what makes your company tick if you also want to be able to lead that company. Um, over the years, I've become a true lover of all things data, design, and UX oriented. Um, as far as being an engineer goes, I am very much a product and UI oriented engineer. Again, it makes me a little bit of a fish out of water at an event like this. Um, you know, I've already mentioned that I've lived here for 19 years and I've seen a ton of change in the industry over those years. Um, and I have two really awesome little three and a half year old twins uh, that I fundamentally adore. Um, in the 19 years I've lived here in Austin, I've worked at companies like Trilogy. Uh, I started an agency called ThinkTiv, but most importantly, uh, I grew up, and I really say that I grew up at a, uh, a company here called Bizarre Voice. I started at Bizarre Voice when I was around 100-ish people. Uh, got to work with great people like Ernest and Chris over there and Victor, uh, all incredible ops people that I, I, I worked with there. Um, you know, from there, I went off to HomeAway where I became a, an architect there, again on the UX UI side, um, ultimately landing in a spot as a VP of engineering at HomeAway. Um, and, you know, it's really important uh, when I think about my career, uh, I think about me uh, and the cloud and the things that having over the last 20 years change in the operational environment of how we build and run software, how that's impacted my career as a product oriented engineering leader, right? You know, I got here in, 2000s, in, in 2000 and I worked at really a seminal Austin enterprise software company called Trilogy. Um, that was really the dark ages. I mean, I walked in and they, we had server rooms that you could see through glass um, and I really felt like I was back in university. Uh, you, know, you, you know, we did releases, things got printed on CDs and shipped to customers. Um, you know, but 
in that time, and at Trilogy, we had a concept, we called it fast cycle time, but really, in my first year, that's when the Agile Manifesto came out and really started to change how people thought about building software. Uh, there was a good five-year gap there, <laughs> but uh, in the intervening five years, in 2006, uh, Amazon EC2, S3, and Simple Queue Service were released. So it was really the first three uh, you know, cloud services that, that Amazon released. And also in 2006, Werner Vogel, the CTO of Amazon, uh, did a relatively famous interview on microservices, going all the way back to 2006, really thinking, changing the thinking around how we deploy uh, services and, and starting to think about how we, we build software and work in large teams and large uh, ecosystems. Um, around that time, uh, I left Trilogy. It was a really interesting time to be there. If you've ever worked at a company that started around 2,000 people and ended up around 100, um, you really learn to become a jack of all trades, uh, doing a lot of different things. Uh, but right at the end of that time, I decided to leave, and I started an agency with some friends, some designers. I was the only engineer in a room full of designers uh, called Thinktiv. And what Thinktiv did is we did rapid prototyping and MVP development. And this was a little bit of a kind of a, a, a revolutionary idea at the time that we could build apps and deploy them quickly. It was also around the time when like full stack web frameworks on interpreted languages like Python and Ruby, basically Rails and Django, were starting to become very popular, uh, popular out there. It was also when Heroku launched. And then really, I think for me and in my head and in my imagination, the birth of what we would now describe as modern DevOps was when you know, GitHub was get the, the, the really the triumvirate of GitHub, Heroku, uh, and, and Rails, I think started this idea of, you know, we had CI, like you know, continuous integration before, but continuous deployment, the idea that you could do a Git push and have the software that you just built uh, instantly deployed to a server uh, and have it up and running for your customers changed our business at Thinktiv, but also started changing the way people thought about prototyping software. Um, I decided that the agency world really wasn't for me around this time, and uh, I ended up moving to Bizarre Voice. At Bizarre Voice, when I, when I got there, we actually did releases, uh, and it was around 100 people, but we were already on a two-month release cycle there, uh, and we were talking about actually lengthening that release cycle. Um, while we were hosted, uh, we weren't really hosted in the cloud, we, we, we were co-hosted, uh, but it was exactly at that time too, actually, uh, that you know, Amazon also released RDS. And what was really important about getting RDS released and being you know, at, uh, at Bizarre Voice at that time was RDS to me was the first foray into platform as a service where it was a managed service, not just a computer that you got to SSH into. Uh, in the AWS ecosystem. Um, when I arrived at Bizarre Voice, I started a group uh, called Bizarre Voice Labs. Uh, I was really the first engineer working in that. Uh, I, was, I was paired very quickly with Victor Track, who's sitting right there, uh, who is really the guy responsible for uh, migrating Bizarre Voice into AWS uh, and moving all of our traffic at the time over to AWS, but one of the services that I worked on uh, as the director of, of Bizarre Voice Labs was the first live production service that we hosted at Bizarre Voice uh, in AWS. Um, at the same time, ooh, something's happening here. We are not getting, oh, it's back. Um, is, you know, open source CI CD was released. Uh, Docker came out, Kubernetes came out. I ended up at HomeAway. Um, you know, and it's the goal, you know, if, you know, I can take any, like, even small amount of credit for introducing agility at Bizarre Voice. When I arrived at HomeAway, my major goal was to get HomeAway to be a significantly more data-driven company. Uh, HomeAway grew out uh, the majority of its scale 
back in the era when people were still doing like back of the napkin calculations about whether or not it was cheaper to be in AWS or cheaper to build your own data centers. Um, Homeway took the build your own data center approach and a lot of that decision was based in, in like from my friends that are still there today, the migration into cloud hosting is still an ongoing thing because there are like real and serious accounting implications for, from transitioning to owning your own hardware to transition to a transition into cloud. What was a capital expense actually becomes an operations expense and the way that you write down things uh, can have a major, major impact on the balance sheet. Um, around this same time, Adrian Cockroft from Netflix you know, did his major talk on migrating Netflix to a microservices architecture in AWS, so another major shift in thinking. Um, and then finally, in 2016, I got to start Data.World, and uh, I'm gonna get to that a little bit. I will say that starting your own company um, and, and being as lucky and, and truly lucky as we are to have the amount of venture capital backing that we have allows you to do things kind of your own way. You get to put a lot of the things that you hear in talks like this into, into action, but you also have to make smart decisions about how you're actually gonna run your business. Um, and, and we've learned a lot doing that as well. So I mentioned kind of my time at Bizarre Voice, and, and when I was at Bizarre Voice, one of the, the, the things that I'm most proud of there is we really leveraged moving into the cloud uh, to introduce agility. So uh, my team at Bizarre Voice, Bizarre Voice Labs, was the first team, and uh, was the first team uh, to adopt AWS, uh, first team to have a live AWS deployment. It was the first team to use GitHub as our, as our source code repository, first team to use CI, CD, first team to do really anything agile. Um, these were principles that ended up getting adopted. And what it allowed us to do in Bizarre Voice Labs was release software a lot faster, iterate with our customers to make commitments that we could actually keep in a significantly uh, you know, more business-friendly way. Uh, all of these principles ended up getting adopted across the entirety of, of the Bizarre Voice uh, ecosystem, across the entirety of the engineering team. When I say I grew up at Bizarre Voice, I, I started there um, you know, I was really, I managed one engineer and he quit the, the week after I started, uh, but then I ended up managing a very large chunk of the, the engineering team, about 100-ish people. Um, and we, have, we ended up applying the princ these principles and DevOps principles to the entire organization. Um, and it really unlocked a kind of velocity that we hadn't experienced there before. It was really meaningful when we needed to basically migrate uh, away from a legacy monolithic platform into a microservices architecture. Um, so it was really nice to be able to experiment on that in new product launches um, to get our working styles and principles down, to adopt agility, to figure out what we're doing in the cloud in these small bite-sized chunks before we rolled it out to the entire team. It was really a, quite a good accomplishment. Um, when I shifted over to, to HomeAway, what was really striking there was we were a top 10 like internet travel destination site. Um, you know, in the millions and billions, uh, millions of uniques, billions of page views on a monthly basis. Um, but um, we still did uh, build time configuration of our sites. So, it was nearly impossible to run more than, say, a dozen A-B tests in a year when comparables were running thousands of A-B tests a year. If you were talking to uh, Expedia or Priceline, uh, they are like, yeah, we run 1,000, 2,000 A-B tests every year. And we're like, what? How do you do that? <laughs> um, but uh, when, we, when I first got there, uh, the entire, because we ran, had this multi-brand strategy where, you know, we had VRBO, HomeAway, VacationRentals.com. Uh, we ran over 30 sites, all that were branded differently. All of them were built off of one platform that actually did build time configuration. So because of that build time configuration, we would actually build 30-ish versions of the application and then deploy them to separate servers, load balance them all, and the only way that we had to run an A-B test was to run a separate, uh, an actual full separate 
uh, instance of an application and load balance to it. So trying to run an A-B test was a near impossibility. Um, what we did then is we broke apart part the monolith. We, we introduced um, a, a business logic layer microservices architecture uh, called Saplings, which allowed you to very quickly spin up a Java 8 based microservice. Um, we introduced Node.js uh, to run the client side. Um, and then we introduced runtime configuration in the form of Indeed.com's Proctor open source project. Uh, by the time I left there, and then we also actually started transitioning slowly but surely into AWS. By the time I left there, we had actually accelerated our A-B testing program. Uh, when I left that calendar year, we had run over 900 uh, A-B tests, and we were well on our way to doing 1,000 uh, successfully and without incident. Um, so I mean, that's just sort of a great example of, of how, we, how we do that. So, data.world. <laughs> we get to do it from scratch uh, at data.world. Um, and when you start a company, you get to say, what principles do we want to adopt? Uh, and what is the culture that we're going to have at this company? And uh, we use DevOps to really drive out how we, um, you know, uh, how we reinforce this culture. Um, and we started by writing operating principles, really kind of the value statements for our company. First off, we drive, drive decisions with data. We start with our customers. Uh, this is a big one. Ownership, accountability, and responsibility. We expect everybody to stick up their hands and take ownership. Um, because we're a startup, we want to build and plan for change, right? Finding leverage where we can, right? We want everybody to take risks and learn from our mistakes, right? You don't get to be a hero unless you're willing to be that guy uh, trying to slam dunk in front of everybody and completely beefing it. Um, we want everybody to use the resources wisely, and this is also part of taking ownership and being accountable. You know, if you accidentally spend $100,000 in AWS, you gotta know about it. Um, this is one of my favorite things I've ever seen in any talk ever, and that's keeping things simple. You might wonder why I have Taylor Swift's Instagram account up here. Um, one of my favorite moments in any talk I've seen at any conference uh, was by the CTO of Instagram. Um, and their principle is to do the simplest thing that works until it stops working, and then do the next simplest thing. Uh, and he told a story about when Taylor Swift signed up for Instagram. Uh, in order to handle the traffic load that Taylor Swift caused, they literally, in the request, they were originally a big Django app, in the request handler, they put in, if username equals Taylor Swift, um, serve this set of static, static views, and we'll figure out how to build those later on. And it worked, right? Um, you know, that could have been an existential moment that caused a complete rewrite of the app and everybody going off and reading all sorts of blogs about how you scale. But really, if username equals Taylor Swift, got the job done. <laughs> um, acting as one team is a really, really big deal at data.world. And it's about having a singular vision and working across the entire business to understand what everybody's needs are, not just siloing and caring about what you're doing. Um, and finally, we want to activate Agile. Um, and our DevOps and infrastructure at data.world truly activates Agile for us. And I put, I very specifically put Agile with a little a there because I hate Agile processes and methodologies. I think all the process guys showed up to the Agile party and kind of ruined it for everybody. Um, what's more important is that we adhere to the principles of the Agile Manifesto and trying to follow any one given process. And that's really what our build and deploy and DevOps infrastructure uh, and tooling gives us at data.world. Um, here's a list of the things that we use. Um, this is our developer workflow. Um, really, our CI CD uh, functionality enables this teamwork and accountability. Any engineer can actually push code that can end up in deployed into production in less than 10 minutes. Um, we do prod deploys probably one to 10 times a day. On average, we have about 20 engineers working at the company. Um, and it really kind of keeps us on our toes. And in that environment, 
enabling simplicity in the form of repeatability is really, really important. We have a saying at data.world, which is basically, you know, if you have a prod, prod problem, if you get page, roll back, not forward. Don't be a hero, right? Because you have repeatability in the process, roll back and roll forward are actually really easy things. And if you knew you're in a stable spot, why would you ever put the stress in yourself of trying to be a hero and solve things live when you can just roll back to a known good? I mean, you released it 10 minutes ago, or even you released it an hour ago, eight hours ago. Rolling back to what it was eight hours ago, it's gonna be okay, and it takes the stress off of all that root cause analysis that you need to do. Obviously, we are a, a massively uh, reliant on AWS and all of their managed services. Um, and we are big into observability and monitoring. Now, how does Agile and DevOps work with the rest of the company? Ultimately, this is how we build and deploy software at data.world. Everything looks like the Death Star. It ain't finished, it never will be, but it works, right? I mean, that half-finished Death Star took out Alderaan, it did just fine at doing that. And that's how we kind of approach things um, at data.world. Fortunately, a lot of the times, a lot of the rest of your company wants you to build and deploy software like this. It's a nice present wrapped up with an awesome puppy inside that we're gonna deliver to our customers um, as a fully realized, well-behaved thing. Um, you know, how do you reconcile these two things? Um, and that's really an area where, you know, that act as one team principle comes into play. You have to be very communicative. You have to be very transparent. You have to involve the rest of the company to be able to do that. Um, and you have to have empathy for what the other people, like product marketers and the sales team, are going through and trying to do with, uh, with your customers. Um, another thing DevOps really, really enables at data.world for us is to work in a regulated environment. We are fully, we are a three and a half year old, 40 person company um, that is fully SOC 2, type 2 compliant. Uh, thank you, Steve Relay, for those of you that know him. Uh, also, Adam McElway, also an awesome guy. Um, so how did we get SOC 2 compliant um, and still have 10 minute releases? Well, we have a Slack bot called uh, DeployBot um, that actually uh, lets you deploy software and request to deploy and then launches an entire audit cycle. So we actually, you type deploy, you can type deploy UI or deploy platform. It actually will look at all the GitHub issues, look at who did all the code reads, um, and then it's push button, sends alerts to everybody that has to press and approve. And we can all press approve, and you can all get out to production very, very quickly. Um, and because it's all in Slack, it actually produces a wonderful audit trail. But without DevOps creativity, um, without acting as one team and understanding what the business needed um, and trying to go for what I call the genius of the and here, um, I don't think we would have arrived at this solution. It was a brilliant solution that without a DevOps mindset, I don't think we would have gotten to. And then finally, we have started selling DevOps as a product in and of itself at data.world because we sell into these highly regulated environments because we sell to large scale enterprises on the commercial side of our business. Um, you know, we built data.world to be this awesome multi-tenant SaaS product. Unfortunately, a lot of companies and customers including major financial institutions and healthcare institutions uh, would prefer to live in a wonderful custom-built single-tenant house. They feel more secure there, um, that's what they want. What we have managed to do at data.world is we've actually introduced a service tier. Uh, we don't have a clever name for it yet, we're gonna come up with it, but basically, uh, what we've done is enable single tenancy through DevOps. Um, the, instead of selling you this nice custom built house in the suburbs, we're gonna sell you a container house where you actually get a single tenant instance of data.world um, that's fully productized and ready to go for yourself, um, but it is all enabled through DevOps, all released, um, still fully managed, but completely segregated. And again, without our, our DevOps infrastructure with our DevOps mindset, we wouldn't be able to productize this and actually offer it as a full service tier. And trust me, we charge a lot of money for this service tier, because it's still not cool to have like a thousand instances of your product uh, out there and rolling around. Um, but we're able to offer it as a product to our customers uh, in a really meaningful way. So, that's it. I've worked at 
incredible companies with incredible people. Having DevOps at those companies has enabled us to be a more customer-driven, agile business in all three of those instances in a lot of really interesting and, and, and really great ways. Um, you know, we wouldn't have been able to do it without it. Um, I apparently have another kind of sit-down session at 3.40 in Suite 7. If you want to talk more about it, I'll be there. Um, and I think that uh, that pretty much covers it. All right, we're good. Um, do we have time for questions or where do we end this session? Other session. Perfect. Thank you, everybody.